Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. There's a story that says sometime in the late 70s, Phil Collins witnessed a man drowning. He was too far away to help and also possibly too drunk, but he wasn't alone. There was another man further down the shore, close enough to save the drowning swimmer, but he didn't. He just stood there, forcing Collins to watch helplessly as the man's indifference led to its inevitable conclusion. According to some versions, Collins later tracked him down and invited him to a show. Then, with the killer seated in the front row, Collins pointed a spotlight at him and debuted a new song that laid out the man's crimes for everyone there. The villain was humiliated and possibly arrested. It's a great story, but fortunately, None of that actually happened. Collins has repeatedly denied it in interviews, and if he did use a concert as an elaborate sting operation, there's no record of it. The real story of In the Air Tonight is a lot less morbid, but no less emotional. After playing with Genesis for eight years, the band took a hiatus in 1978 so Collins could focus on his relationship with his first wife, Andrea Bertarelli. But according to Bertarelli, it was too little too late, and after years of neglect and a troubled marriage, she finally filed for divorce. This was the backdrop against which Phil Collins sat down to write and record his first solo album, Face Value, and its legendary lead single. To this day, he says he doesn't really know what In the Air Tonight is about, just that it's angry angry, and that it comes from a moment of deep pain and regret. So with that as our starting point, let's take it apart. The song starts like this. With a mellow drum beat programmed on a Roland CR-78, and there's three things that immediately stand out to me. First, of course, it's a drum machine. In 1981, that was still pretty novel. The thin, quiet sound of the synthetic drums makes the beat feel distant and subdued, and it's playing with precise, mechanical precision. This same pattern will play for over three minutes, and that repetitive, unwavering pulse gives the song an almost trance-like quality. The drums serve as an anchor while the rest of the music just sort of washes over you. That effect is complemented by the second thing, which is the lack of a snare. The snare is the most aggressive drum, and it's the main driver in rock beats, so removing it makes the pattern feel empty. The kick, meanwhile, is almost completely absent from the first bar, with a barrage of hits in the second. This, again, makes it feel empty, but it also adds a sort of ebb and flow that further contributes to the trance-like atmosphere. It almost feels like the music is breathing. And the third thing I want to talk about is the asymmetric rhythm. There are two metric accents marked by the open hi-hats, and they fall on beats one and four. The space between them is filled by offbeat toms, creating rhythmic tension that cascades into a resolution on the final beat. And by the space between them, I mean most of the bar. This uneven distribution gives the rhythm a lopsided feel. Instead of the constant momentum of a standard rock beat, the groove seems to collapse in on itself at the end of each bar, then start over in the next one. It has a clear, unambiguous sense of closure on beat 4, where the music seems to reach its destination, hold for a second, and then change directions. If the kick makes the rhythm breathe, these pauses are that moment of equilibrium between inhaling and exhaling, and drawing your attention to them through metric accents makes the groove feel almost hypnotic. And that simple, minimalist drum beat is going to be playing uninterrupted for the next three and a half minutes, because In the Air Tonight is an extremely slow burn. It's building to something, but it takes forever to get there, adding all sorts of tiny little flourishes along the way, so I'm gonna talk about every single one of them. No, seriously, we'll get to the drum fill eventually, but I'm gonna make you work for it. I really want you to understand how careful and nuanced the buildup in this song actually is. They're always adding something to ramp up tension, it's just very slow and very subtle, so it never seems to actually reach that next level. This buildup begins, as all great songs do, with a distorted electric guitar. <sighs> And that's an interesting choice. It's pretty quiet in the mix, but through cultural and physical connotations, distortion has a sort of inherent loudness to it. When I hear that chord, it doesn't sound quiet, it sounds far away. It conjures an image of a guitarist posing on a mountaintop, cranking their amp up as high as it'll go, and smashing out a power chord that travels for miles. And if you have that image in your head, you know what that guitarist does next. They play the chord again and again and again until it erupts into a super heavy riff. At least, 
That's where my brain goes, but instead, they let the sound fade, unaccompanied except for the drums, for six whole bars, and we don't hear it again for over a minute. It feels like a broken promise, a direction the song could have gone if its anger was burning just a little bit hotter. But it doesn't go there. Instead, once the guitar is gone, two things happen. First, we get this low D played on a Prophet 5. which just hangs out for literally the rest of the song. That's the nice thing about synths. There's no physical reason for the note to ever fade, so if you want it to play for five minutes, you can just do that. The synth doesn't care. Anyway, this permanent drone on the root adds another layer to the hypnotic feel of the track. It quickly fades into the background, but it never actually disappears, like the tonal equivalent of a white noise machine. It gives the music a sense of inertia, anchoring it in place, and that, combined with the complex emptiness of the drum groove, is most of what defines the baseline energy for the song. Everything else is happening on top of these two parts. And there is something happening on top of them here. A second undistorted guitar playing a really fast tremolo that releases into a sort of whale song bend. Much like the distorted guitar, this blazing fast tremolo is an interesting choice for such a slow, quiet intro. But that bizarre mismatch in activity is balanced by a gentle fade-in that keeps it well below the newly introduced bass part until the very end. And we never hear anything like it again. It's just a passing thought, a fleeting moment of rising passion that comes to a head with a bend up to E, then quickly disappears. Next, we get our last key component of this arrangement, the chords, again played on a prophet. The synth sound is split and treated with some delay, so the two sides are slightly out of phase. If I slow down the attack, you can hear each chord spreading from left to right. creating that massive, ambient atmosphere the song is known for. Harmonically, I like to think of this as the pacing tiger loop because it's so effective at conveying a sense of restlessness. Basically, it's walking back and forth between D minor and B flat major, two very similar sounding chords, connected by C major in both directions so that every chord motion moves by whole step. Each chord feels like it's leading into the next one, so there's never really a place to rest, and the direction is constantly changing, so while there's motion, it feels like it's stuck in one place. That lack of actual motion is amplified by the bass, which keeps sitting on D, so the progression takes on this anxious, almost fidgety character, and Collins feels trapped in his own thoughts. And there's one more part before we get to the vocals, a really high syncopated rhythmic figure played on a Fender Rhodes. I couldn't isolate this part, but if you listen closely, you might be able to pick it out. Compare this... to this. It's pretty buried in the mix, but the extreme range combined with a rhythm that introduces 16th notes to an otherwise 8th note groove makes the music feel shiny and cold. Not the most important part in the song, but it wasn't there in the first statement of the loop, so it still counts as a new layer. Besides, it sounds pretty, and I like it, and that's what music theory is all about. Anyway, vocals. I can feel it Melodically, it's just playing around with D minor pentatonic, but I am interested in how he manages to make the line sound so high. I mean, it's not. Collins doesn't have the highest range in rock, but this should still be comfortably in his middle register. And yet, to my ears at least, it sounds like he's working a lot harder than that. As far as I can tell, what he's doing is leaning it further into his mask than he needs to, not enough to sound nasal, but enough to give it a brighter, higher sounding tone. He's also applying a subtle strain to his throat, creating the illusion that this is a difficult note. On the recording side, they used a compressor effect with a slow attack and a fast release to make the hard consonants at the start of words like coming really pop, I can feel it coming. which combined with those subtle vocal adjustments gives his voice a distant, almost robotic timbre. It's a really cool effect. In terms of phrasing, he starts each line on beat 2, so it sounds like he's responding to the chord changes rather than driving them. I can feel it 
This gives his delivery a laid-back, passive sort of vibe, as if he's merely an observer of the events he's describing, rather than an active participant. That feeling of detachment is further emphasized by the chorus structure. Most of the time, in Western music, phrases come in groups of two or four. It's a pattern that's deeply ingrained in us through centuries of musical tradition, and up to now, the song hasn't given us any real reason not to expect it. So when Colin sings his third phrase, it seems pretty safe to assume we're about to hear a fourth. But instead, he just repeats the O oh Lord, trailing off mid-thought, and then we finally see the reappearance of the distorted guitar. It's a return of that angry outburst that started the song, and again, it feels like it's gonna build to something, but again, that expectation is subverted. Instead, the synth hangs on the D minor chord, joining the drone in its harmonic stasis and holding things steady until the guitar subsides, along with the anger it represents. When the chords do start moving again, they're moving slower, and after the little outburst at the end of the chorus, this makes the verse feel much more deliberate, like he's choosing his words extremely carefully. I've seen some sources say it's the same progression as the chorus, just stretched out to two bars each, and like, yeah, that works, but it's not quite right. He's still moving from D minor to B flat and back, but the C chords have been transformed. The first one is now a minor, which shares two of its three notes with C major, so it can fill a similar harmonic role. For the last chord, he plays F major, which shares two of its three notes with A minor, so once again it can do the same job. And that's why I like this transformational approach here. It provides a sort of harmonic lineage. F major is a reasonable substitute for A minor, which is a reasonable substitute for C major, so while this definitely isn't a C chord, we can say it's behaving like one. And that's supported by the voicing. Up to now, every chord has been in root position, but here he flips it around so C is the lowest note, giving us that all-important B flat C D walk-up we're expecting to here. And to Myers, these transformations help release some of the restlessness from the chorus. Instead of those constantly pacing whole steps, we get a big drop, then walk back up the scale to start over. It's a more directional sort of sound, as if it's actually going somewhere. That'd still work if the last chord was C major, but using F instead blunts the resolution. F major and D minor share two notes in common, so while you still have C stepping up to D, the rest of it stays still. This creates a much more subtle return to the one chord, and prevents the loop from feeling too directional. Again, we've got a really delicate balancing act. The song has to want to move forward, but it can't actually do it. At least, not yet. Over top of that, Collins has switched to a very different kind of vocal phrasing. In the chorus, his delivery was passive, starting each phrase on beat two, but in the verse, each phrase starts with a pickup, leading into an accented syllable on the downbeat of the new chord. This positions him in a much more active role, directing the flow of the music instead of merely responding to it. The lyrics are still talking about his feelings, but by changing the vocal phrasing, he's become more of a main character in his story, setting up the beginning of a narrative journey that, again, promises to take us somewhere interesting. The verse also introduces a tiny little fill at the end of every four-bar section, played on either the Rhodes or the guitar. These fills are carefully placed during the gaps in the vocal phrase, in a sort of call and response pattern with Collins, creating more momentum without increasing the dynamics. Listening to it, I keep expecting one of these lines to spin off into something larger, developing into an actual counterline that plays against the main melody, but it never does. It's always a couple notes, just enough to remind you the instrument is there, and then it fades back and disappears again. That brings us to the second chorus. Here the fills continue, and they start to intertwine with the melody. The guitar wraps itself around the O oh Lord in the first phrase, and in the second half, the Rhodes takes on an entire background line. But the biggest, most notable changes happen in the vocals. There's three of these. First, they introduce some additional vocal parts. I'm hearing two extra voices, one doubling the melody in a lower octave, while the other splits off into a high harmony. These extra voices are panned off to the side, preventing them from fully blending with the lead and giving the track an even greater sense of space. And speaking of space, the second thing they add is an echo to the end of every line. 
again widening the perceived sonic landscape. Interestingly, the background vocals don't seem to be included in the echo, which calls into question how real they're intended to be. Are they a crowd, or just voices in his head? We may never know. And the third thing they do is add in a fourth phrase. Remember how the first chorus stopped after three? This one doesn't. We get a nice even set of four, rounding out the section instead of cutting it off early. It's a hard thing to assign any specific significance to, but it does still feel like a progression, like the song is becoming more complete as it goes. He still does the repeated Oh Lord, though, followed by another return of that distorted guitar, once again trying to get something started, but just fading off into nothing instead. Still, it's a reminder that, in principle, this song is supposed to be building towards something, which we finally get at the start of the second verse. Oh, is that it? I thought we were gonna... No? We're just going back to the same drum loop and synth pads again? Okay, fine. Whatever. I didn't want a dynamic climax anyway. But seriously, if you look at the waveform of this song, you can see just how much of an outlier this moment is. It's a huge shock and a clear indication that we're about to get the payoff we've been waiting for, but it's just another trick. The song isn't going anywhere. This explosion of vocals, which in case you were wondering was done with a vocoder, was a momentary blip on our musical radar, and it's gone just as quickly as it arrived. But we are in the home stretch now. You saw the waveform you know what's coming. We've just got one more verse to go, so let's speedrun it a little. After the vocoder, it drops back to a sparse texture. Pretty quickly, they add an echo back on the voice, but they're much more sparing with it than they were in the chorus, using it only for the ends of specific lines. Near the end of the first loop, the high harmony voice comes back, and that builds up into another brief visit from the vocoder. The last time we ever met. In the gap after that line, the Rhodes starts playing its own melody. The harmony vocals stay in for the second half, and Colin starts things off with an embellished melody, hitting a new high note for the song. The synth pads start to get louder, the Rhodes gets another little fill, Colin sings this, and then... All right, we made it. Buckle up, it's drum fill time. Drum fill part one, the rhythm. This is what's called a double trecio figure, which is four groups of three, then two groups of two. That adds up to 16 sixteenth notes, which fits perfectly inside a bar of 4-4, four, four, but it's a much more exciting pattern. The groups of three last just long enough to feel a little polyrhythmic, maintaining this prolonged clash against the implied pulse. The groups of two at the end read as an acceleration, ramping up the speed and energy and delivering you onto the next downbeat. <laughs> It's an incredible pattern for rhythmic resolutions, creating a massively powerful landing at the start of the phrase. And Collins increases that rhythmic tension even further by doubling up his hits in each group of three, drawing your attention even more to the gaps between the accents. Drum fill part two, the shape. This fill is played mostly on toms. There's some kicks in the gaps, but the top line is what people remember. And to create that, Collins used a specially constructed kit with six separately tuned toms as opposed to the normal three. Each hit uses two of them for maximum impact, and he cascades down the set as it goes, from the smallest toms to the largest, giving the fill a really clear melody. Now, we don't tend to think of drums as being melodic. They are, after all, unpitched percussion. I tried to run this clip through Melodyne, and it got mad at me. So yeah, yeah, no discernible pitches here, but, like, come on, listen to this, and tell me you don't hear a descending melodic line. Cause while there's not really a definite pitch, there's absolutely a relative pitch. Larger drums sound lower, and having so many toms to choose from lets him take advantage of that to create a melodic contour, if not an actual melody. Drum fill part three. The sound. If you know anything about production in the 80s, you probably know that I'm about to say the words gated reverb, but let's talk about what that means. As the story goes, gated reverb is a technique that was invented by accident by Phil Collins and engineer Hugh Padgham during the recording of the Peter Gabriel song Intruders. Padgham had turned on the reverse talkback mic, which lets the artist in the recording booth, in this case Collins, talk to the engineer. That mic is drenched in compression, so the person sounds the same no matter where in the room they are, and it has a 
noise gate so it only picks up their actual speech. Padram forgot to turn the mic off, Collins started playing, and the two of them realized that the sound they got was absolutely incredible. They wound up rewiring the talkback mic to record for intruders, and on later collaborations, including this one, they developed a more effective setup to get the same results intentionally. That setup consisted of a couple ambient room mics placed far away from the drum kit, which were then treated with a noise gate and a lot of compression. These two effects do basically opposite things. Compression makes the quiet parts louder, and noise gates make the quiet parts go away. Together, the heavy compression meant the mics were picking up a ton of the natural reverb and room tone of the recording booth, but the noise gates meant they only did that during the actual drum hits, not the parts in between where the sound slowly decays. This gave them a drum tone that was simultaneously explosive, but also clean, with more than enough reverb to feel enormous, but none of the excess noise that would muddy up the mix. It's a brilliant use of the technology available at the time, and wound up being one of the defining sounds of the 80s, but its most famous use is probably still this one song. Drum fill part 4, The Context. There's a reason I structured this video the way I did. As true as all those other things are, I don't think the fact that this is remembered as one of the greatest drum fills of all time has anything to do with anything that happens in the two and a half seconds it takes him to play it. All the groundwork that goes into making this so memorable is done in what is effectively a three and a half minute long intro, with that slow, seemingly never-ending build to nowhere. The song keeps promising it's about to do something exciting, and after a while you just kinda stop believing it. Especially after the vocoder thing, it just doesn't seem like it's ever gonna deliver on that promise, so when the drum fill starts, the natural reaction is to assume it's yet another misdirect. Obviously he's not gonna bring in a whole drum kit out of nowhere. I mean, come on. Were you even listening? It's not till partway through the fill, or maybe even after it, that it really sinks in that this time is different. We finally reached the mountaintop, and that mountain was a volcano. From there, we move into the chorus loop, and there's definitely some more stuff to talk about here. There's an actual bass line, some new stabs from the electric guitar, and of course Collins is playing a new drum beat, where the impact of that gated reverb is a lot easier to hear, but honestly, I don't care about this. Like, it's good, don't get me wrong, but it kind of feels like a MacGuffin. It doesn't really matter what happens here, as long as it's significantly louder than anything that happened before. In the Air Tonight is a drum fill wearing a song as a hat, and all the heavy lifting to make that work comes from the build-up, not the ending. And they seem to have known that, because they don't really do much here. They just loop the chorus and fade out. Collins does a few more vocal embellishments, oh, and on the second chorus they add a violin, but for the most part, the last minute and a half of the song is just a victory lap for having achieved such a perfect execution of such an extremely slow burn. And that's pretty much it, but before we go, I want to address the mythology that surrounds this song. Over the years, Collins has repeatedly used it to frame himself as a blameless victim in his divorce, having simply come home from a tour to find his family gone. His wife had an affair and decided to leave him, and he channeled the pain of that betrayal into writing this song. That's a great story from a marketing perspective, but reading Bertarelli's version, it's... Okay, look, I don't know these people. I wasn't even born when this all went down, but it's pretty obvious that things are more complicated than the romanticized version Collins presents. Now, to be clear, there are no allegations of abuse, at least not that I could find. He just seems to have been a bad husband and a bad father, using his work with Genesis as an excuse to avoid making his family the priority it needed to be, and letting his temper and his ego get in the way of fixing things once they were broken. According to Bertarelli, even the story of how it ended leaves out all the affairs that he had first, and reading her accounts? I'm inclined to believe her. So I don't want to end this video with a monologue about how great art comes from pain, because while this song is great, a story that focuses just on the pain he felt, not the pain he caused, is incomplete. Framing Bertarelli as the cold-hearted villain so that Collins can play the tortured genius is dishonest and irresponsible, even if it's a whole lot easier. And that's kind of why I'm glad that In the Air Tonight is so vague and open to interpretation. Phil Collins can say what he wants about its intended meaning, but the song itself leaves plenty of room to find other stories that ring a lot more true.
Anyway, thanks for watching. As always, I'd like to give a huge shout out to my amazing patrons. It's still surreal to me that these little elephant videos have become my full-time job, and that's all because of you. I'd especially like to thank Blake White, Susan Jones, Jill Sundgaard, Howard Levine, Warren Hewart, Damian Fuller Sutherland, John Hancock, and Jeff for their extremely generous support. And if any of you watching want to help me keep this channel going, or even help decide which videos we make, there's links to our Patreon page in the description. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above Above all, keep on rocking.